The New Testament reading today is from chapter 16 of Matthew, verses 21 through 27. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one is about to come with the majesty of his father, with his angels, and then he will repay each one for what that person has done. Praise be to the word of God. So what's to lose? You know, we, we sang our hymn this morning, O Young and Fearless Prophet, and one of the things that was suggested to me that I could do as a visual, and then it struck me as we were singing that hymn, that if I asked people to say, which flag will you really walk to? I know that's taboo. I know it's taboo. Which flag will you walk to? Our hymn from 1931 asked that very question. Which flag will you plead allegiance to and pledge allegiance to because we are all one under this flag, right? Under this flag. But I think we forget and we think that we're all one under this flag. And wherever we go, and people who have traveled to other countries, we go to church, right? And we are welcomed there, especially for Mike and I, when we moved to the United States, brand new Canadians with really great accents. You think I have one now? You should have heard me then. We went to church, and we knew that was the very place that we belonged. So I want us all to remember are we under an American flag or do we stand under a Christian flag? And what, right, what are we asked to be and to do when we stand under the Christian flag? It's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I would say this in Canada as well. Don't you worry. When we're here, this is our flag. When we walk out of it, it's also our flag. It's the reason I should not have been mean to that young woman who was just trying to help me on a call. But I was frustrated and she didn't, didn't understand my question and that's not fair. And I was not standing under the Christian flag. I was standing under the flag of Brenda, thinking that I had some right to be cruel to somebody who was doing their job. All right. I felt moved to do this. I have a pretty strong idea of what we think is divine. I can know this because it's reflected in the way that we keep our churches and our sanctuaries, and I just want to put a beautiful shout out to uh, Irma and Crystal this morning. Ah, oh, my gosh, look at this. Is this a beautiful visual display? We still have the colors of Pentecost because we're still in Pentecost, but reflected also are the colors of fall as blessedly we're moving into cooler temperatures. So it's in the way uh, that we keep our churches and our sanctuaries. Everything pretty much has a place. Um, its place is where it stays and, and, that, and that can be for a very long time. The sanctuary is orderly and for the most part kind of uncomplicated, right? Things don't change much and order is really important in the church. But we really do know deep in our hearts that this isn't how God works. He does change things, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Uh -huh. 
He plucked Noah out of Gerar into the land of Canaan. And before that, he set Noah and his family and an entire zoo afloat on a boat for 40 days and 40 nights. And if we jump ahead a few thousand years, we get to Jesus. It's all a bit messy by human standards, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And I, I don't mean to criticize God, but there are people being commanded to live here and then there. And it's a little like maybe being a military family, which I never was. But I know a lot of people who have been. The orders come, and we set out again to a strange place. And God commands in the Old Testament, and we move. But Peter has in his mind, just as we do here today, that anything divine ought to be orderly and tidy. It's this that Peter reacts to. He cannot place the one he has only just in the last breath, identified as the living Son of God, as the one to be murdered. This is not divine at all. Mary is nodding her head. It's a rather messy business, actually. If I casually came to you and said, yes, um, I have to leave you, and it's going to be because uh, I will be murdered by Mountain Sky Conference, you might be like, what? Uh, I, I don't think so. Why are you going there? Right? That's the scenario here. But God does demand unusual and difficult things from us. We know this if we're reading our Bibles. He asks that we give like the widow who puts her last pennies into the temple offering box. Now, that seems silly in a time when we are all busily planning retirements or living in them and trying to have stable incomes and pensions towards that goal, right? Or feeding thousands of people from five fishes and two loaves of bread. Oh, that is just, it's such silliness. Who ever heard of such a thing? It's this that Peter reacts to. It's how all of the, the disciples react when Jesus turns the world's rules on its head. God is to be murdered? Say what? Say what? Now, as we have been reminded before, we sit on this side of resurrection, right? We sit on this side of resurrection from death. We celebrate Easter morning. And uh, Peter hasn't, nor have the rest of the disciples. And here's a little first century background from my Wesley Study Bible. John, the Baptist that is, is the first major character in Matthew to identify Jesus as Messiah. And in the first century, messianic expectations varied. When understood with David, right, King David as the pattern, Messiah was expected to, ready, to gather a purified Israel in preparation for God's reign, purify and rebuild the temple, and deliver Israel from its enemies. So let's offer Peter a little grace after having his hand slapped by Jesus. Let's remember on which side of the story we sit in history. I see myself in Peter. I do. I always have. One minute getting it so right and then failing epically. And uh, like the time I was a kid, oh, I can see this so vividly. I rounded the corner for second base during a game of pickup baseball, yelling, watch out for second base, where there was a mud pond created by the rain that we'd had the night before. To find myself 
<laughs> very ungraciously sliding through the mud puddle into second base. My entire right side covered in mud to the point where I had to go home and my dad had to hose me off with the hose in the backyard before I could go into the house. Or the time as one of my sisters and I were exiting our house and I began to say, um, dad needs to, never, I never even got to finish the question, instead performing an arabesque-like flight into the fir tree, standing at the side of the walkway. And once my sister and I had finished our hysterical gales of laughter, I mean, we laughed so hard, I continued to finish the sentence, ice that top step. My intentions were good both times, but I just barreled right ahead into a waiting disaster, both times. And Peter's intentions were good. He wanted to save his and his religion's image of the divine, right? Keep the edges tidy. No murder in that story. No murder in that story. So he barreled ahead with the best of intentions. And I noticed something, though, that I'd never noticed before in these stories. God commands, right? I just walked us through that. And Jesus invites, follow me. And I don't mean to make God, again, out to be a tyrant, but you can see how the way God interacts with us here changes. In Genesis, Abram's call goes like this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's hand, house to the land that I will show you. So Abram went. And earlier God said to Noah, Make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. This is how you are going to make it. Right? God is a creator. God is a builder. God told all kinds of people how to build things to very, to, a, to specificities, right? There were specifications. But Jesus invites us to follow. And we get some help here with the Greek meanings from our reading. In Matthew, the words opiso mu, behind me or after me, signify discipleship. The proper place for a disciple is behind Jesus, in the place of a follower. For example, Jesus is called to Simon Peter and the others, follow me, literally, come, o piso mu, and I will make you fish for people. In a discourse about discipleship with the disciples, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me, literally, come, o piso mu, is not worthy of me. And in this week's passage, if any want to be my followers to come, o piso mu, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Peter is the recipient of blessing in our reading of last week, but now he is putting his own thoughts ahead of the ways of God which makes him a stumbling block, a hindrance to Jesus' mission. Nevertheless, and this is significant, Jesus does not break relationship with him. Instead, he reminds Peter of the proper place for a follower. Behind me. Let's see how Satan fares when he attempts to sidetrack Jesus off of his mission while Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. We remember that. In Matthew 4.10, Jesus expels Satan from his presence. Go away. Hepie. But to Peter, Jesus, is, Jesus adds words that remind him of his place as a disciple. Go behind me. Hapie o piso mu. Jesus reminds Peter that as a disciple, he is meant only to follow. So the teacher corrects him, as is appropriate, 
and Saint, but Satan is sent away from him. Peter is only reminded that his call is to follow. And on the third day, he will be raised. That's the side of the story on which we sit. Look, following Jesus is not easy. Right? I pointed that out. It's not easy. It's full of conflicting thoughts and feelings and emotions. And, you know, we break hearts. We break commandments. We break promises. We break all kinds of things in all kinds of ways. But God even called Moses a murderer, a murderer to set his people free. God isn't afraid of broken stuff. If God was, I would not be standing in the pulpit in front of you. Instead of walking away from, this, of, uh, from us, God walks towards us. God came to us. Think about that in the context of the stories of Noah and Abraham and Sarah. God spoke with them and visited with these patriarchs and matriarch, but he wasn't physically present as a living, breathing human being. God came to be in relation with us in the ways that we do with one another. We make a new friend. We invite them to coffee. Maybe the next time it's to lunch. Jesus invites us to be in relationship with him. But there is more than just the cost of a coffee attached to this relationship or the cost of lunch at a diner. Ah, Jesus wants our whole life. And that can make me cry because it's hard. If we open that beautiful invitation, I can see how beautiful it is from the, in, uh, I can see how beautiful it is in the stories from Matthew that precede this one. The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, the healing of the Canaanite woman's daughter, the healing of the mute, of the lame and the blind, and those with demons. And all the while Jesus is preaching, the, the, is teaching the disciples, instructing them in this new way of God's mission. These instructions come in the form of the parables, the parable of the sower, or the tree and its fruit, which is mentioned twice. The harvest is great, the laborers are few, and the golden rule. They're all there in Matthew. So the sermon title is What's to Lose? And it sounds to me like God has offered it all to us. So really, what do we have to lose? Not much except financial security on earth, right? And we know how that turns out sometimes. Even if we put our eggs into all the right baskets, it doesn't always guarantee anything. And maybe the affection of some, some people around us, you know, maybe we lose some affection from people that are around us if we follow God and we follow Jesus and God's mission. And Jesus knows all about that. But God offered us God's entire self so that we could experience heaven on earth. And the best news is God wants us. God wants all of us. Every last one of us, every first one of us, God wants us all. So I ask, what's to lose? Amen.